My name is Vladimir Oltan, and uh, uh, I think my camera is not yet started. Give me one second. How's that? I work for NXP, the uh, semiconductor company, and I'm here to talk about DSA switches. Um, so DSA stands for Distributed Switch Architecture, and it's a kernel framework for managing Ethernet switches, meaning those multi-port chips that uh, forward packets based on destination MAC address and VLAN ID. Uh, for starters, one of the perennial questions coming from driver writers is whether a particular piece of hardware should be driven by a DSA driver or a plain switch dev driver. Uh, this might be incorrectly be phrased as DSA versus switch dev, which kind of creates a, creates a false dichotomy because DSA and switch dev are not alternative solutions to the same problem. SwitchDev is simply the API that the Linux bridge uses to offload its data structures to compatible hardware, while DSA is a framework. And uh, it has existed before SwitchDev has. And while DSA does now integrate with SwitchDev for the bridging aspects, it also manages many other aspects uh, which are outside of SwitchDev's competence. For example, uh, the defining characteristics of a DSA switch is that when you want to send the packet to it, you never do that directly uh, through an IO resource that the, the switch exposes, like a DMA engine or a packet or a register-based MMIO. Instead, uh, DSA switches have uh, one of their ports connected uh, to an Ethernet controller of the Linux host, and to send or receive a packet, you need to do it indirectly through that other driver. Um, uh, so DSA's specialty is kind of managing that relationship between that host port called DSA master and the switch itself. Uh, to get you in the right mentality for understanding DSA's goals, it's important to mention that while all of the ports of a DSA switch might be identical from a hardware point of view, the framework treats them differently according to their role. That port I was mentioning, which connects to the DSA master, is called the CPU port. Uh, it's, uh, if you will, an infrastructure port, and uh, it's a shared port, which is only used to pass packets back and forth to other ports. So to the network stack, it really serves no purpose, and user space doesn't need to know about its existence. Uh, the other ports in the picture labeled switch port 0 to 3 are front-facing ports of the switch, and they are called user ports in DSA terminology. A user port has a network interface associated with it, and that interface uh, is expected to be capable of receiving and sending packets through it. But the transmit and receive functions for the DSA network interfaces are kind of strange, and they look much more similar to the data path of a virtual interface like a VLAN than those of a normal hardware driver. So this is because DSA switches typically have the ability to insert tags in the packets when they send those to, towards the host. And similarly, they understand the metadata tags that are placed by software in packets uh, when the software sends them one, and they will interpret uh, those tags and then strip, or strip them when they send the packet out. Um, one more thing, generally speaking, DSA switches can be connected by board makers to any Ethernet controller. And therefore, one of the DSA's design goals is to permit any unmodified Ethernet driver to behave well as a DSA master. Uh, for reception, DSA uses a packet type handler, uh, which parses the tag added by the switch, it strips it, and then redirects the SKB towards the virtual interface, which corresponds to the user port that the packet ha has ingressed on. So those were the user ports. Lastly, there is a third class of DSA port roles, uh, which are not shown in this picture. And uh, these have to do with the D in DSA, and D stands for distributed. And that's a, a totally optional feature, which means that switches can have cascade ports towards other switches on the same board, and they can build really complex and diverse topologies. Uh, these cascade ports are simply called 
DSA ports, for lack of a better term, and similar to CPU ports, they are shared but are irrelevant to user space. So only the user ports are. So DSA doesn't create any network interface for cascade ports either. They are hidden and configured implicitly. Uh, so you're a user, and when you use a board with several DSA user ports and they belong to different switches, that's pretty much invisible to you, and you don't need to do any special configuration at all. Uh, DSA just manages the entire group of switches as just one big switch tree, the switching fabric. And uh, it brings the shared ports up automatically, and the DSA master, again, it brings it up automatically as well. So all you need to do is just open the user port, put an IP on it, and then start using it. Um, all the, um, okay. So again, as part of uh, user experience, there isn't any user space sp uh, tooling that's specific to DSA, quite the opposite. And DSA ports don't even switch between themselves by default, and that confuses some people. Uh, if you want to enable switching between two ports, what you can do is just create a Linux bridge and put the network interfaces of those ports between it, uh, under it. And you can also create a second bridge and put other two DSA ports under that second bridge and you've just created a second forwarding domain, which is isolated from the first. By the way, if you have questions, I might not pay full attention to the chat right now, but there are logical pause points between slides and that would be a good moment to do so verbally. Um, hey, Vladimir, Sarona here. Uh, good to see you in person. Um, Hi. We had a question on the previous slide, just to kind of understand the DSA architecture. Uh, is the intent of the architecture or framework to kind of just make it appear to user space as if each of those uh, switch ports or SWP, as if they're just part of the host device? Like, are just, Is that the abstraction you're trying to get the abstraction is that the only thing they expose to user in to the user space are network interfaces and right. those interfaces are just like any other user interface. Right. So to them, it, they're no different from ETH0. They're like you can exactly. hide the fact that there's exactly. a system of needs. Okay. Exactly. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the question. Nice to hear you, by the way. Uh Okay, so if you've been following the first part and you've been thinking, uh, wait a minute, did you just describe an Ethernet port multiplexer with uh, in-band uh, channel selection? You know, my switch is really not like that, like at all. Uh, yep, that's what I did. So uh, that's also the main talking point of my presentation and the reason for the title, Domesticating a Savage Beast. Uh, the networking maintainers typically when they see a driver posted for an Ethernet con uh, connected switch, they say, oh, you need DSA in your life. And uh, now having recently joined that club, I kind of see where, where they're coming from but I'm also here to tell you that, okay, it's not so bad. Let's just discuss the changes that we've been making to DSA in the past few years in order to not shoehorn that model on top of switches that really are thought out differently. So please consider it, that if there really was another way, like setting up the switch in the bootload and then never touching it again, or writing a user space driver for it, but then leaving fine management up in the air or whatnot. If any of that would have worked just fine, I would have not been here talking about DSA. And I am going to go through these individual things in the next slides. So one of the greatest ways in which switch implementations vary from one vendor to another is their view of the management model. Uh, so the majority of network switches, which are capable of management, have some sort of distinction between the data plane packets and the control packets. Uh, these different flows are superimposed on, the, on top of the same hardware ports, and that's important to understand. So to visualize that, it may be helpful to, to look at them three-dimensionally to, to see the key differences between them these two planes. So at the most basic level, uh, control packets, 
must be used for link layer control protocols like STP and PDP. And that's because they have the ability to target a specific egress port and to override its STP state. That means to inject into a blocking port. Uh, these control packets, they are made to typically bypass the forwarding layer of the switch and the frame analysis stage of the CPU port as well and are injected directly into the egress port. Uh, and one of the implications of that, at least the one that's really relevant here, is that hardware address learning is not going to be performed on the CPU port for this type of packets. And generally speaking, you could see the CPU port as essentially a God mode port for control uh, packets. Uh, there's the opposite side of the spectrum as well, and those are the data plane packets, which don't perform STP state override. They are subject to hardware address learning for the CP on the CPU port, but they also cannot be steered towards a precise destination port, since they are, of course, subject to the forwarding rules of the switch. Um, and the format of these packets, again, might vary wildly from one switch implementation to another, but it can vary from a special bit in the DSA tag, which says, okay, I am a data plane packet to the complete absence of a DSA tag. So for these packets, the CPU port essentially acts as any other bridge port. Um, okay, so now a bit of classification, depending on the volume of, con of uh, control packets that get sent back and forth between the host and the switch, I like to think of there, uh, of there being like three different classes of switches. On one hand, I would like to call fully managed those switches where all traffic can be sent as control packets uh, towards the switch. And that is an operation which can actually be sustained at line rate. Uh, the assumption, assumption, unfortunately, has been that this will be the case for all switches. So for the longest time, the DSA tagging protocols have all constructed only control packets. Um, there is one special case of devices, however, that seem to not support control packets at all. And for those, DSA has used a no-op tagging protocol. And this behaves radically differently from uh, all the others because the interface for the user ports are essentially dead in terms of packet IO. So they are only registered for interacting with the file library, but otherwise a user's got to send traffic through the DSA master and the switch just switches. So this is really the opposite of the model that DSA is kind of trying to enforce and it really hurts it overall because we do support it entry for a couple of switch drivers. And to some people that usage model is the only one they've seen and the only one they know. Okay, so what do these people do when they want to send the packet towards a precise switch port when the only thing they can do is send through the DSA master? Uh, well, they create a bridge, they set up a bridge VLAN that, uh, uh, that includes only the desired egress switch port, and then they create a VLAN upper interface for the DSA master, and then they send their traffic through that VLAN interface. Um, Okay, so now I'd like to move on to the third category and I'd like to call this lightly managed switches and focus on it just a bit. Uh, for the lightly managed switches, control packets are supposed to be used for just that, uh, link local control protocols, so nothing more. Sending a control packet may be an expensive operation and it may not be able to be sustained at line rate. So as far as the hardware design is concerned for these, the bulk of the traffic, uh, meaning the data plane packets, should be injected with no DSA tag at all, or otherwise said, directly through the bare DSA master, basically just like in the case of unmanaged switches. Uh, yeah, but having control packets transmitted through one net device and data packets through another is even stranger than just sending them all through the DSA master. So something needs to be done in order for data packets to be sent through the switch virtual interfaces. And uh, that's one of the changes that were made. This uh, along a, a while ago, this is uh, the reason that has led to the introduction of the software defined DSA tagging protocol, which is called tag802.1q. 
And this basically does the same thing as what is being done with the unmanaged switches with the no op tagger. Uh, and that is to steer packets towards a precise switch port using VLANs. But the difference is that with tag 802.1q, we do this in kernel. So basically it just looks like any other tagging protocol and you preserve the DSA usage model. Um, you absolutely still don't need to use the DSA master for anything. You could keep ignoring it. And uh, that's the whole point. Uh, the way tag 802.1 works is that source port identification on RX relies on the hardware inserting a certain port-based VLAN ID that uni uniquely identifies that port. Um, the problem is that this only works when the port is standalone or under a VLAN unaware bridge. Uh, when the port is under a VLAN aware bridge, the packet might have a VLAN ID which is not port based and needless to say not unique to that port. So kind of there goes the source port identification based on that. So yeah, tag it to that one can push us further, but not far enough. Uh, VLAN aware bridges are indeed an important use case and we should have a lightweight solution for supporting CPU terminated traffic uh, even in that case. Okay, so at this point, just take a step back and just go back to the hardware designer and just ask them what to do. And they'll be confused and ask, so why do you need to know which source port this packet came from exactly? It came from the bridge. And while that does make you pause for a bit, there is some truth to it. So let's try to implement it and see how far that gets us. We don't know the precise source port, so just lie and report a plausible one or imprecise. Um, okay, so as long as you satisfy some basic sanity requirements inside the software bridges ingress path, then it turns out the bridge is happy to accept that packet as valid and it's even going to process it on behalf of the imprecise DSA port that was reported. So, okay, we've solved reception, but that breaks transmission. And the complications come from the fact that the software bridge might learn the source MAC address for these packets on a potentially wrong port. And then on the return path of the, of, uh, uh, those packets, they are going. Uh, the bridge is going to deliver them towards that wrong port. So we need to kind of insert another hook. We need to give the essay the chance to write the wrong and fix a lie. And that chance is actually called the TX forwarding offload, and it's a brand new bridge feature. So it goes like this: uh, the software bridge avoids cloning an SKB, uh, which uh, needs to be flooded to multiple ports, and it sends only one copy of the packet towards a single network interface from each hardware domain, quote unquote. Uh, and this is a new concept as well. It's, uh, I'm going to explain that further. Uh, from each hardware domain that the flooded packet must reach. So then it becomes the responsibility of the port driver to look up its own hardware FDB for this packet and replicate it as needed in hardware. So uh, this is a feature that's of course useful in itself and is one of the reasons it got accepted. And it was uh, in fact initially submitted by Tobias Waldekrantz for an entirely different purpose. Uh, because with switches which have a large port count, you can significantly reduce the amount of multicast traffic that you send on that link between the DSA master and the CPU port because you replicate uh, the packets inside the switch and not with SKB clone. And in the general sense, uh, for hardware that declares the TX forwarding offload feature, the bridge basically partially lets go of its FDB lookup and delivers the packet with uh, SKB offload forwarding mark set to true which means it's a data plane packet. Okay, so how does that help us? How can the lightly managed and unmanaged switches send data plane packets? Uh, well, at the very least, they can insert no DSA tag at all 
and just let the packet slide in into the hardware, basically not telling the switch what to do with it. It's uh, basically an uh, I'm feeling lucky packet. So uh, just this time, it's not sending it through the DSA master, it's sending it from the DSA network interface. So this works and it also makes the imprecise reception work correctly because the transmission is also imprecise. So to explain that, even though the software bridge uh, learned the MAC address on the wrong uh, port, um, that source port is in fact in the same hardware domain with the right port. And even though the software bridge is incorrect, uh, the, the FDB of the software bridge is incorrect, the hardware FDB isn't. Okay, that was this slide. 10 seconds of pause. If there isn't any question, I'm going to the next one. Okay. Next topic is uh, offload, offloading and on offloading upper interfaces. So recently, DSA has gained support for offloading other virtual network interfaces than the Linux bridge. And these are the HSR driver, and this supports the HSR and PRP redundancy, industrial redundancy protocols, and the bonding and team driver, which support the link aggregation protocol. Um, sadly, I'm not going to go into details on these because they're not the main topic, but this work has triggered a discussion. Well, not all switches are capable of offloading HSR and lag, and uh, DSA's policy has always been to fall back to a software implementation, since the bandwidth to the CPU is oftentimes not that bad that this is impractical. So maybe we should do that. Okay, but it turns out we can't really enforce DSA's policy right away with the expected results at least, due to two major rule blocks that we faced. And first is, the Linux bridge, which through switch dev makes a wrong assumption about ports being capable of offloading forwarding because uh, it bases that decision uh, on the physical switch ID, which is reported by the bridge for net device. In that case, uh, it's the bonding interface and uh, the physical switch ID is actually a, rec a recursive call that goes all the way down into DSA. But of course, from DSA's perspective, to not offload an upper interface, it means that the physical port should behave exactly as it would if it was standalone with no switching. So the physical switch ID was the, the metric based on which switch dev determined whether forwarding between two net devices would take place in software or in hardware. And that means same switch ID hardware, different switch ID software, but there were two different interpretations of the same configuration. And this has led to a redesign of the switch dev API in that drivers must now explicitly mark themselves to the bridge, the network interfaces that are capable of autonomous forwarding. The new default, of course, being that they aren't. Uh, so in this new model, even if two interfaces report the same physical switch ID, they might uh, yet not be part of the same hardware domain for autonomous forwarding as far as the bridge is concerned, and forwarding between them should take place in software. Um, that was issue number one that was actually solved. The second one, which is still in progress, is FDB isolation in switches. So up until this point, the vast majority of DSA drivers, as well as the framework itself, have considered that that it's enough to offload multiple bridges by enforcing a separation between the ports of one bridge and the ports of another, just at the forwarding matrix level, um, meaning port A can, for, or can forward to port B, but not to port C. Uh, so this works as long as the same MAC address, or in the case of VLAN where bridges MAC plus VLAN pair is not present in more than one bridging domain at the same time. But the issue which is described in the picture is that a DSA switch is still a switch, surprise. And for every packet that it forwards, regardless of the configuration of this ingress port, it will attempt to look up the FDB to find the destination. 
So in the picture, when the packet is received on the standalone switch for zero, which is under an unfloated lag, it will see the FDB entry pointing towards switch port three uh, from the hardware bridge. And then it's going to try to short circuit the CPU and forward directly to switch port three. But due to the isolation rules we have at the forwarding layer, that is blocked, so it will fail and it will drop the packet. So what's FDB isolation? It's this hardware specific mechanism, uh, which we're going to put in place to prevent that in individual drivers. And it makes FDB lookups performed on a source port, stop matching FDB entries that point towards a port that is not in the same hardware forwarding domain. And there are going to be API changes that encourage drivers to do this and associate FDB entries with a given bridge ID and not have them visible in the global namespace. Okay, another 10 second pause. Okay, next topic, uh, RX filtering and in the context of DSA, RX filtering refers to the technique of teaching switches, which addresses must be filtered towards the host and delivered to the CPU ports. So even if no such thing as a MAC address for a switch port exists, because it forwards, never terminates, DSA network interfaces do have one since they are capable of more than forwarding. That's kind of the premise of the model. And by default, that address is inherited from the DSA master, but there's an option to override the address of each port from other sources like the device tree. And traditionally, DSA has not configured the switches in any way so as to make sure that packets which are destined towards the switch ports addresses or the DSA master's address or bridge upper interface address are filtered only towards the host. So what's going to happen will of course depend on exactly how the hardware works, but the typical case is that of a switch where software for or where software uh, is going to send only control packets to the hardware and the switch is of course not going to learn from these packets so it will never be aware of those addresses or maybe it flat out can't learn uh, the addresses. So in that case any rule matching these packets is simply absent from hardware. So the packets destined for the host are going to reach it by flooding. The packets however are not going to be flooded only to the host they're going to be flooded towards all other ports that are in the same bridging domain as the ingress port. So yeah, needless to say, there was a desire to address this. But that wasn't the only problem. It turns out that addresses corresponding to host interfaces aren't the only ones that need to be sent to the CPU, not by flooding, because there are many kinds of use cases where DSA switch ports are in a bridging domain with so-called foreign interfaces or non-DSA interfaces. And the typical example of this is a Wi-Fi router where the LAN ports are handled by a switch and that switch is in the same bridging domain with a Wi-Fi access point. Um, in that particular setup, the effects of not having address learning on the CPU port can, can be much more disastrous. Uh, for instance, when there are migrating stations from the LAN ports towards the a uh, Wi-Fi access point, which is behind the CPU port from the switch's perspective. So not going into too much detail, you'll effectively end up with a stale address, uh, which is going to cause packet loss until it expires. And there was also a desire to fix that second issue. So, okay, but where to fix these problems? Um, another thing I need to point out uh, is that if we take into consideration that FDB isolation thing discussed earlier, uh, standalone ports do not have a problem here. And this is because uh, standalone ports should be placed by drivers in a hardware FDB partition where no learning takes place and packets are flooded only toward, uh, towards their only possible destination, which is the CPU port. Um, okay, so the issue needs to be fixed at the switch dev level 
And uh, just like that, DSA became a lot tighter integrated with the software FDB of the bridge, and it started sniffing for two classes of FDB entries and offloading them as FDB entries uh, pointing towards uh, the switch's uh, CPU port. Class one are FDB entries, which are learned on foreign interfaces in the same bridging domain as a DSA switch interface, and this solves the Wi-Fi roaming issue by introducing an opt-in feature, which is called assisted learning on the CPU port. And this actually replaces the hardware alternative, which may be missing. And second class of FDB entries are those that are local or permanent. And this actually means the same thing, which is not forwarded. So the bridge marks the MAC address of each bridge port as a local address, and the same goes for the bridge's own MAC address. And by offloading these entries to hardware packets targeted towards the bridge itself are no longer flooded in the entire bridging domain. Ooh. Okay, if there are no questions, let's go on to something a bit more lightweight, which is to talk about uh, DSA support for cross-chip bridging uh aka the dn dsa so traditionally the cross chip setups supported by dsa have been daisy chains and the definition is that all switches except the topmost one lack a dedicated cpu port and are simply cascaded towards an upstream switch and cross chip bridging refers to the ability of packets that are ingressed on the port of one switch to be of uh, to egress the port of another switch without going through the cpu uh, so it's important to mention that DSA declares that all switches belonging to the same tree have the same physical switch ID from switch that's perspective, which makes the bridge treat them as a single uh, switching fabric. Uh, so daisy chains worked just fine, but I've had the pleasure of learning uh, about two, uh, two completely new switch topologies, and these needed some work and brain power, and I'd like to discuss them even if very briefly. Um, so one of the topologies we've had to support is a board with multiple switches that don't understand each other's DSA tags, but we're nonetheless connected together. So a DSA tree is by definition comprised of all switches which are connected directly to one another and they use a compatible tagging protocol. This was not the case here. So the correct paradigm is for each switch to constitute its own switch tree with one element hence the name, disjoint trees. In this picture, there are three trees. There is one internal switch and connected through SPI are two external switches, one hanging off of each of the first two internal switch ports. So the ports of the internal switch are both user ports as well as DSA masters, but what they are not is DSA or cascade ports. Okay, so for this topology, there were two distinct questions to answer. First, for uh, traffic termination, would tag stacking, tag stacking work well? And the second question for autonomous forwarding, who would make sure that the tags pushed by the ingress side of switches are popped in all cases by the egress side? So the first question was kind of easy to answer because a packet received by switch zero port zero will end up having two tags on the top of the DSA master, which is ENO2. The tags are, of course, going to be stripped in the order determined by the switch's proximity to the topmost DSA master. And since the uh, directly attached is uh, uh, to ENO2, which is topmost, is the internal switch, that's the tag that gets stripping first. The new owner becomes switch port zero and so on recursively. Okay, uh, the other question, uh, what happens when a packet is forwarded from its external switch one to two. So that's way more interesting in my opinion and something that was not supported before. So the, the joint trees were supported already and but if you want to uh, enable forwarding between switch one and two, like for example, you create a BR zero interface and you put all of switch zero port zero to three and switch one port zero to three into BR zero, that's how you tell the system that you want cross-chip forwarding. So we've modified the DSA API to permit cross-chip bridging between these uh, between ports belonging to any tree. Uh, 
But even then, we need to establish some sort of ground rules. Uh, so for a packet to uh, be forwarded between these two switches, it must go through the CPU port and in the ma most basic configuration that happens in software just fine. But of course, we would like to accelerate that because you know the internal switch is a switch and it's desirable that it doesn't hit the actual CPU. Um, and as long as the internal switch has some elementary understanding uh, by, of, of the packets, even after they've been mangled by the external switches, the SA tag, that should in fact still be possible. And what you need to do in that case is you create the second bridge BR1 and put switch port zero and switch port one, which are the DSA masters in BR1 and a forwarding happens 100% in hardware for these. Uh, I see we're kind of running a, a little bit late, unfortunately. I uh, wanted to talk about H trees a little bit and maybe I ju I'm just going to say what they are um, and it's actually a name invent invented by me, so drop me a line if you have a better suggestion. The name comes from the fact that there are multiple switches which are laterally interconnected through cascade ports, but to reach the CPU, each switch has its own dedicated CPU port. So uh, that differs from uh, uh, daisy chains. Uh, and it turns out that to support such a system, there are two distinct issues. First is with regard to RX filtering, you need to uh, avoid addresses bouncing between the CPU port of one switch and the other. And the second issue uh, has to do with uh, packet loops because it's actually possible to send the packet towards one switch, that switch to send it to the second switch, and the, the second switch will flood it towards all ports including to its own CPU port, where this packet will be again processed as a receive packet. Okay. So the wrapping up slide, and I'm sorry that this is uh, uh, so late, uh, is that we've been extending DSA in two directions, and uh, this, this took a good amount of creativity more than anything else. And the first direction is in breadth. We try to cover a wider variety of switches and uh, try to have better means uh, from now on to cover even more uh, and also support new switch topologies uh, that these switches come in. And we would like to have more the open discussions uh, with vendors that have uh, their special view of the world and see what we can do to make DSA a better framework for that. And the other direction is in depth and we have fixed some long-standing issues like for example, the lack of uh, RX filtering. And um, there's still a lot to go. And uh, if you are interested, you could go check out the full paper. So that's about all that I had to say, so thanks. Thank you. We can take a question, I think, maybe one or two, if anyone has any questions. Andrew Lunn says, the switch dev model is that each switch port looks like a normal interface. DSA provides a framework to make this happen, but pure switch dev drivers also do it. Yes, this is a correct point. So it is basically the responsibility of switch dev that we have a network interface for each port. But on the other hand, uh, driver manufa uh, device manufacturers that uh, make discrete switches will never end up complaining about switch dev because they're not going to write a pure switch dev driver for them. So DSA kind of gets all the blame for that. But of course you're right. It's uh, the switch dev model to blame. Although, on the other hand, to be fair, DSA has enforced the same model even before switch dev, so maybe that's something to think of. We can have a lot of time, but I, I'm kind of curious, what do you think about testing? Because it seems like there's a lot of the divergence between the vendors, how they behave and how they interpret things. 
And I would yep. be really scared that when I'm changing something, I will break someone's weird application running on a you know two year old kernel, and then I will yep. not know for another two years. Yep, that's kind of the biggest problem. So one of the things we've been trying to do was try and compartmentalize. Uh, I'm not sure what the word is. Uh, basically, uh, create uh clear categories uh, like for example for tagging protocols this is a big thing we have distinguished between uh taggers that put their uh header before ethernet uh, at the place of uh the ether type or at the tail of the packet and we have some sort of testing support for tagging protocols to be run on a generic uh interface basically that's the dsa loop and the maintainers actually do that from time to time when they see um, a new tagging protocol being submitted to the kernel, they test it on what they have, even if they don't have the hardware. But of course, there are a lot of things that you can't cover. And uh, what we try to do is simply ask questions to understand what is kind of the mentality between the, uh, behind that particular uh, hardware model. I don't really think we could do a lot better than that. We have some testing for the data path, but the, the switch control path belongs just, you need the switch. We tend to have a lot of community support here. It's a very active subsystem, so people tell us when we break it and we fix it quite quickly. Yeah, yeah that happens too. All right. Sounds good. I remember when I was working on BPF offload, the uh, BPF offload would break from time to time because people were changing BPF. So I thought it was better to just add tests and try to as much as possible, at least provide some abstract tests. So, so yeah, like they can yeah, be run yeah. by a CI effectively. But I mean, you probably have to run tests on your own hardware whenever people post patches, right? I uh, actually, yeah. We don't yet have um, like a consolidated uh, self-test infrastructure for DSA switches. There are some patches. There have been some attempts to do that. There's nothing in mainline yet, but uh, maybe we could do something about it. Some of the self-tests that Melanox provides kind of work might do, but they tend to assume lots of ports, and we tend mm -hmm. to only have a few ports, so that's a big problem. Yeah. Anyway, for for the FDB isolation pass series that was posted a, a few weeks ago, there was a self-test associated with that. Like, let's say I was removing the RTNL mutex from uh, uh, from FDB ad, and that might have uh, turned up some race conditions in the driver. I did catch some of those in the drivers I maintain with a self-test. I did provide them uh, as part of the past series, of course, that isn't merged yet, but maybe there's a start for anything and things like FDB dump nonstop while you add an FDB entry that could be, uh, also nonstop that could be a starter. Also things that are not always geared towards the same stuff that Mellanox is trying to do with their hardware, because I'm feeling that we're targeting very different spaces here. <laughs> All right, since we're out of time, let's cut it off here. Thanks a lot for the talk and, and the paper associated with a lot of great info in it as well. Thanks a lot for listening. <laughs>